Good evening, everyone. It's uh, Jim here at Cheater to You, and uh, a warm welcome to uh, one of our live AQA A level psychology sessions. And it's the first time we've done a, a paper or revision clinic. We thought we uh, we've had loads and loads of questions from students when we were on the workshop tour in the cinemas, but also in our live stream since on the Grey Booster course, asking us all kinds of questions about the papers, about specific topics, about exam technique, about what the grade boundaries is going to be, all that kind of stuff. So we thought, why don't we just have a Q and A? Q&A uh, to to try to answer as many of those questions as possible. And I thought to myself, who can I get? Who are the two people who know most about this? And uh, fortunately, uh, they, they couldn't turn up. But uh, this evening, I have got Lara and Laura. Only kidding. So uh, you many. Th- say that? Did you? Yeah, am I that? Am I that predictable, Laura? <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> so the way this works is obviously we've got the live chat here, which is great, and we've got lots of people joining us in the live chat. Um, and uh, so therefore we probably won't get a chance to answer all the questions that come in, but we'll do our best. Or say, I say we, Laura and Lara, will do their best to answer as many as possible. And uh, what I'll do is I'll stick uh, stick them on the screen. You might spot one, Lara, Laura, that you think, oh, I want to uh, pick that one up. So I'll try to find those as we go. And uh, let's see where we get to, shall we? I think we're looking for about, what, half an hour or so, maybe a few minutes longer, depending on how many questions there are, Laura. Yeah, there's a, sorry, there's a question that's just come up that I just want to nip in the bud. Okay. Um, how much non-advanced info should we know? Just to clarify this, don't get confused with other specifications, what other subjects are doing with psychology AQA advanced spec. That is what you need to know. That's what they're going to question you on. They're not going to question you on other parts of the spec that haven't been named in that. Saying that there are areas of the spec, such as when we look at social influence, resisting social influence, it, it would be good idea to know and be mindful of, you know, resisting in terms of conformity and obedience, even though conformity is not on the advanced spec. So there's little nuggets like that you need to be aware of. OK, but you are only going to be asked questions on the advanced spec. Fantastic. Well, there's, a, there's our first question answered. So that's the idea. And uh, we'll try to get as many of those covered as we go. And uh, of course, there could be some questions that uh, Lara and Laura aren't quite sure about the answers to. It's unusual. They clearly might be. And uh, the other thing to say is we've no idea at all what's going to be in the exams, not involved in, in any way, and we're not in, not in the game of making predictions. But I know we've had lots of questions, so shall I throw this first one? This was this one came in fairly early, so I'm just going to throw them in there. Laura, Laura, over to you, and uh, good luck with the session. Thank you. I'm trying to keep up with all the questions that are coming through on the chat. It's like, you just can't wait to answer them all. The advanced nice. spec are the researchers that you absolutely have to know. So when you look at the advanced specification, and Laura, do trip in when you want, tell me to shut up. Um, in the advanced spec, the researchers that are in there, they're the ones that you absolutely have to know. In other words, they're the ones that AQA can ask you specifically on. Any other research that you've been taught, it's not to say it's not important, but it is to say you won't get asked a question specifically on it. So yes, you do need to know other research for evaluation, but the absolute research that you must know inside out, like the APSC, AIM Procedure Finds Conclusion, all the details, um, you need to know You need to know confidently, okay? So you need to know the researcher's name, definitely. You need to know the details of it. For example, in attachment, they've asked a question before, outline Lorenz's procedure for Mark. So you need to know the procedure in detail, for example, for Lorenz. So, um, yeah. All the other studies that aren't quoted in the spec, you won't get asked specifically on, but that's not to say you won't need them for evaluation. Laura, do you want to add anything there? No, I think we could we could sit here and recite the list, but there's there's still a fair few, isn't there, really? Um, and I think Laura's right. Make, keep looking at the advanced information list because the likes of Milgram's study isn't on there, but the situational factors is so therefore you would need milligram study anyway so you know don't rule don't rule certain things out like laura said before as well and in fact there was a question that just come up there about situational factors are they an explanation of obedience and yeah the answer is yeah they are and they are on your advanced information as well um okay did you pick out any other questions that, that came up uh, early should we make sure how does the so, eleanor here uh, explanation about cultural relativism. I don't, don't really know. understand the link. Different opinion traits in different countries. So when you're looking at cultural relativism and culture bias, you don't really need to look at it specifically for the different, um, the different smaller explanations of obedience. When you talk about obedience, you are going to talk about agentic state, 
where we we do things because we act on behalf of people you'll talk about legitimacy of authority so if we perceive someone to have authority then we will well we're more likely to obey them but in terms of culture bias apart apart from just saying about different social norms and different expectations i'm not sure where you would need to make that link to be honest what about you laura no i think if eleanor if you if you're considering evaluation for legitimacy of authority i would say be selective with your evaluation it's definitely easier more obvious evaluation to be using for those situational explanations of obedience you know make mm. sure you are recycling um milgram's study for example and the variations there that can really demonstrate and support legitimacy of authority in terms of you know the location in terms of the uniform for example um and obviously you can use studies like bickman as well which is really easy to remember very similar studies like that so but like laura said i would say just think about the most effective most kind of um re the most relevant evaluation point if you like for your theories try so, some students try and make a point fit where it doesn't fit is what i'm going to say and i and just a an overall note is that if you don't feel confident with a particular evaluation point and you don't quite understand it even at this point now with your paper one being on tuesday i would actually kind of say don't use it and and try and think about maybe recycling an easier point maybe from issues and debates for example that you might understand um kind of the backing a bit more and how to apply that to other areas so yeah you know, the only other thing I think you would say, to be honest, about culture, and this is certainly what I would say to my students, is that um, for situational variables, like Laura said, just keep referring to Milgram's study, because the evidence for legitimacy for authority is that they lost the legitimacy when they changed the venue, the proximity, the evidence is, is back in Milgram's study. But that still means that you can say that overall, the way that Milgram viewed obedience and the way he designed the study you can still say that that lacks um cultural universality or whatever way you want to say it because it's still an american western viewpoint of what obedience is and it's still this assumption that obedience is a bad thing or blind obedience is a bad thing and of course that's not the belief in every culture so that's probably the only route i would go down personally for that one you, you've got better discussions of, of cultural issues in other sections i think how much research methods do you think will be in paper one? It's like an impossible question, this one, isn't it? I would say um, no more than normal. I don't think there'll be any more than normal in a typical year. But there are elements of paper one where it's, it's almost a natural fit to fit research methods in. So if you do an attachment, I would expect any year, not necessarily just this one, questions on observations. If you're doing something on memory, and we know that there's there's not as much in memory advanced information as there are in some topics. So they could potentially, we don't know this, but they could be planning on putting more research method stuff in there. So generally tend to like asking you about experiments, about data analysis and things like that. I don't think, what do you think, Laura? Laura I don't think there's ever been anything massively tricky in research methods in paper one. I think they save all the... The, the no, I mean, for yeah. us, we'd probably say it's not too tricky, right, the research methods. But as we know, a lot of students do struggle with research methods. And it is very much that basic underlying um, understanding of our key terms, which is really going to help you out with answering a lot of the research methods questions that applied in paper one. So you know that in the advanced spec, none of the research methods have been taken out. So I think with that, knowing that knowledge is that, you know, you should feel most confident on research methods because, as you all know, it is embedded into every single topic. So, yes, it's very hard to predict the degree to which research methods is going to show up. But as Laura said, it's not going to be any more than usual in terms of what you used to do with, your, with the sample papers that you might have been practicing. So, And someone's just asked, Casey's just asked, could statistical tests come up on paper one? Yeah, they can. And yeah. they can come up on paper three as well. Even things like... Um, how would you write a reference for such and such a thing that can come yeah, up by absolutely. Any So yeah. all bets are off with research methods, I'm afraid, which which is probably why they haven't took it off or took any we've information. Got, off. We've got quite a few questions as well, Laura, about students asking us and asking us to predict and what we think about the 16 markers. I just want to iron that crease out right now because I know a lot of yeah. you are asking that is Laura and I are not going to be able to predict, unfortunately, even if we look at all the previous questions. 
we're not going to be able to predict what 16 markets are going to come up. But all I will say to you guys is, look, I know we've had a very disrupted couple of years, but this is advanced spec and a lot has been cut out. In terms of normality of the amount of topic plans and content that needs to be learned, you guys have got quite a reduction in the amount of content you need to learn. Okay, so there's no way we're going to be able to predict what 16 markets can come up. Also, there's nothing to say that if you look at a previous paper and you think, oh, that 16 markers come up, they're not going to ask it again. AQA have been known to ask, you know, a question on the same topic again, if it's not answered very well the previous year. So we can't predict that. And I would say it would be, um, it wouldn't be smart to base your revision around predicting what 16 markers can come up. You need to know everything, unfortunately. So you really have to plan for all 16 markers. Yeah. And someone's actually just asked how many 16 markers could you have on paper one? Um, you would love to be able to say no more than one. And in, in the old days, there, there were certain things that were capped. But we've seen papers in the last in, in the last few normal years that we had. I think do you remember there was a paper where there was about two eight markers and two sixteen markers and all yeah. sorts of it was a terrible one. So again, we can't predict that. You'll get at least one, we can assume that. Yeah, and um, I think it could be anywhere. Yeah, I think because the spec's been reduced quite a bit, and I, I maybe I'm gonna get told off for saying this, but because the spec's been reduced quite a bit, it's highly unlikely you're gonna have a 60 marker in each section or maybe stretching to three because there isn't that much of the spec there because it's you know it's reduced. So yes, whilst you're likely to get 16 markers, don't expect it to be any more than what it has been in previous years, okay? Because there's less information, so more likely to ask um more kind of small smaller questions perhaps with lots of research methods in so yeah it's not going to be any different from previous previous series basically in terms of the amount of 16 markers or extended questions for that matter we're getting lots of questions on grave boundaries as well which which is like the golden question isn't it every year can you predict things and what are the grave boundaries and i think if we had the answers to that everyone would be getting a stars i just so wonder if know Laura how the grey boundaries are done because I think with the knowledge of how the grey boundaries are done that might help them understand why we can't answer that really yeah and someone has put it in the chat I think actually the grey boundaries they never vary too differently to the previous years but they're not really decided till after the event unfortunately um, so I, th I think I, if, if it still works like this, I think um, AQA do a sample of marking and from there they get the grade boundaries. So it really depends which sample it is that they mark in terms of what informs those grade boundaries. So you can use um, the last typical year. I would you look at them and use them as a, as a rough guide that'll, that'll get you far. Someone's asked, will the grade boundaries be lower because of where we're at? Um, and there's a lot of people thinking, will it be harder? Because if everyone's got the same advanced information, it's almost, not to go into sociology, but it's almost a little bit of a more level playing field, isn't it, than usual? What do you think of that, Laura? Do you think that'll be harder to get top marks or to use it? Yeah. It's hard to say, isn't it? Um, not sure. Not sure. We've I got... think all you can do is just carry on as you are forget everybody else the one thing we've been saying to our students is that for example everyone knows that the work and memory model could be on there so everyone is going to be prepared to write stuff about work and memory model which means that whatever you write has got to be written better than however anyone else is writing it and that's why when we did the grade booster we focused on things like the wow point and the double whopper and single whopper verga templates the ways that you write things matters as well as the content and what you put in it so if we're looking to get higher grades i think for this year especially the way that we write things is going to be as equally as important as the content of what we're writing as well any Hi, more questions so coming up? Question, laura she said um how many marks for a1 and a3 and eight marks and 12 markers i actually think do we have this in our um yeah da, 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 i think we do so eight markers um Usually the split is three and five. So there's always, I think in your head, remember there's generally always more marks for AO3. However, for a 12 marker, the split is usually equal. So six mm. and six. Um, 16 marker is your six and 10. So again, generally speaking for the extended, 
I think even with the 12 mark, you should be spending more time on AO3 because it's a harder skill. Students very easily overwrite on the AO1. So it's just something yeah. in the back of your head that you should be really mindful of that actually, okay, don't overwrite on the AO1, get onto the AO3. It's a harder skill. So it's probably going to take me longer to do thinking and writing. Um, Laura, what do you think about that? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is definitely not the plan of action, but just so everybody knows why it's important to focus on AO3. If you're doing a 12 marker, and, and I think um, you would only really get 12 marker in research methods and paper one, but for a 12 mark essay, let's just say for argument's sake, even though it's six and six, if you only do AO1, you won't pick up any AO3. But if you do AO3, you could accidentally pick up AO1 because mm. the way that um, the way it's generally assumed is that you can't write good evaluation without showing you, your knowledge. So that's where you'd pick up some AO1. So, so for more than the obvious reason, AO3 is definitely the focus for, for essay writing. Just to say a few questions on 12 markers after we've just mentioned it. Some of you are asking, is the 12 marker only AS? Can you only get it for research methods? Just to, just to be clear here, your maximum marker that you could get is 16, obviously, as you'll know. You could get anything under a 16 marker. So you could potentially, it's unlikely, like Laura said, but you could get a 12 marker, a 10 marker, you know, whatever on a topic. Obviously, with research methods, specifically the design of study questions, that tends to be 12 marks or 10 marks, for example. So that's more likely in that area to be a 12 marker. But your maximum is up to 16. So you could get anything underneath that. Realistically, they could do. Yeah. So just got a few more questions coming off that. Can you be asked to write a consent form? Yes, you can. You can be asked to write a hypothetical consent form, what you'd say in a debrief, debrief instructions. standardised instructions as well. Yeah. Can you be asked to design a study? Yes, yes. 100%. But only on paper two. So yeah. you wouldn't be asked to design a study in paper one or three, but you could design a study for 12 marks on paper two. In fact, they like to do that quite a bit, don't they? And that definitely needs practice. Um, oh, Muscan asked a question up there. Um, can you get marks for drawing diagrams? Uh, yes, you will get um, credit for drawing a diagram. So if, if we take the example of multi-store model of memory, yes, you will but you really do need to complement that with writing. So, it, you know, if you draw the diagram and label it, I really encourage students, actually, if there's a diagram to be drawn, I would draw it. Um, just because I think that really helps with the structure and it acts as almost like a plan of what you need to write. So, um, yes, is the answer to that, Muscan, yes. Someone asked about economic implications before. Um, before we move away from research methods, let, let's just clarify that some of the things that you're asking about, like key features of science, design of study, they're, they, they're specifically paper two stuff. The likes of the things that you'll get on paper one, if any, are, are going to be generally um, maybe a stat test, some, some data to analyse from a memory experiment, you know, what's wrong with observations, what's good about them. So some of the things that um, and quite rightly so, you're asking the right questions about them, but that we could come back to that in more detail on the next exam clinics. So somebody asked about economic implications. Um, and you know, It's a funny one, that isn't it? Because why it's not an area recording? you can revise for at all. It's kind of yeah. using your initiative in terms of the STEM that they give you and thinking about how that is going to positively affect the economy or negatively affect the economy. And, you know, part of Mark's schemes previously have been, you know, included in there have been things like the NHS and the implication on our healthcare system specific to the UK. So mm. it's, it's definitely a tricky one. And as much as you can revise a textbook for implications, I think there you, a really good thing to be looking at is the previous mark schemes for the economic implication questions to see what they're really looking for, because they're usually quite comprehensive, the mark schemes for economic implications. They give you some really good ideas um, and pointers to start thinking about. There are some Generic ones, I think, which, you know, you can always have as go-tos, can't you? Things like Bowlby, change hospital admissions, uh, change adoption policies and so on. Eyewitness testimony, a lot of people miss out on that one, but the cognitive interview technique, that that's an implication. Your treatments and mental health conditions, uh, your CBTs, all that type of stuff, they're all implications for the economy because they help people return to work. Um, the improved quality of life and, and, and so on and so forth. So there are some standard ones that you could have as examples. Now, that's not on your advanced information, but that's a really good example of where actually you can still use that knowledge to get some really good evaluation, no matter what you're talking about. 
Eve's asked a good question here, Laura, Eve Williams. So does social sensitivity fit into the ethical implications bracket? Social sensitivity. Um, yeah, it does. If you now, this is a really good question, actually. If you're asked a question on ethics on paper one, then I wouldn't bother talking about social sensitivity. You always have to think social sensitivity is like uber ethics. There's ethical guidelines, you know, the stuff that we have in research, like your consent, your debrief, your protection from harm. That's really what you're on about in paper one. Social sensitivity is is beyond the study. It's, um, you know, how does a study potentially damage society? What consequences are there for the for different ethnicities and whatever? Whereas for paper one, you don't need to talk about all that with Milgram and Ash and Zimbardo and all that type of stuff. Yeah. But you do definitely have to know that for um, paper three. So, again, yeah. we'll do but that I, I would say it would come thing. under ethical implications as a, as a heading, but I would say if you got that question wording in paper one, you would be going towards the ethical issues yeah. and those implications more than social sensitivity. Unless it was really obvious that it was social sensitivity, that's definitely more, I would say, a paper three kind of issue to be discussing. I don't think you get marked down for it, though, because it's technically is an ethic. Yeah. Um, it's just probably a, a, a more mature answer than what they would probably expect on paper one, but there's nothing wrong with that, is there? Um, Tali has asked, how briefly would you explain studies? That really depends on the question, um, actually. Um, but I think if you're, I guess if you're using a study to support a theory that you've outlined in AO1, let's say, so if you're using a study um, to support something, you're really going to be focusing only on the findings. And I think that is quite a big common mistake that students make in the exam when they're using a study in evaluative sense to support or contradict something, they end up outlining the whole study. And that would get counted as AO1 partial marks unless you've written it and packaged it in a way for it to be evaluated to support or contradict what you should be evaluating. So I think that's quite important in terms of the key studies. So when I say key studies, the ones that are quoted in the advanced spec um, and you're asked to, let's say, outline, evaluate a research study into whatever topic, you would need to know that in detail. And, and for that, I would outline the full, it'd be the sh full shebang. So the aim, procedure, finds conclusion for that. So, like, for yeah. example, if you've got a question on describe and evaluate a study into the effects of institutionalisation, I would be outlining, let's say, Rutter, let's say, for example, in detail in AO1. And as much as you can as well. You have to milk those studies because there's not lots yeah. of details in some of them. Um, and then if you're going to use research for evaluation, you, you almost flip what Laura's just said. If you're using research for evaluation, you want to use maybe the fine things in the conclusion if you're writing an essay on um bulby's maternal deprivation and you want to use for evaluation the 44 thieves really tempting to just start telling the whole story about the 44 thieves but the question's not on the 44 thieves so you just need to do what you need to do and then get back to whatever the question's on um someone asked a good question there but i think i've missed it what if you it spot on? the name laura and laura shout it out and i'll try and find it there's so we many great so many there, great Andrew. questions coming in I'll, I'll i'll see if i can put it on screen if you if you shout the name out yeah we did have some really, really? and i think a few of you are discussing this now but i don't know who originally wrote it it was about the advanced spec for improving the accuracy of eyewitness testimony i can't remember yeah, who one. wrote it originally that you're writing all so fast i can't keep up with it all but it was do you just need That's to know it, cognitive yeah. interview or do you also need to know anxiety? There we go. Anxiety and misleading information. I found um, it, Laura. It, found it. Thank you. <laughs> it's just the eyewitness testimony. Otherwise, it would, the spec, the advanced spec would say anxiety and misleading information, which it doesn't. So hopefully that irons that crease out for you. Yeah. It's, I think that was a bit of a funny point on the advanced info, wasn't it? Because improving yeah. eyewitness testimony, including cognitive interview. I mean, we only do the cognitive interview, so it was a really tricky word. And someone else asked me this, and I was thinking, well, technically you could say things like avoid post-event discussion, um, reduce anxiety, blah, 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 but there's absolutely no way you've got enough to talk about it in a question. So I'd, I'd would I put my career on it only being the cognitive interview? I think I would. <laughs> I'll put myself out there. It's only the cognitive interview, definitely. Yeah, I, I think so. Alfina anyway. just asked a question in AO3. Can you have a mark for explaining what something is before using it in your evaluation? 
one, it depends on the wording of the question. Two, it doesn't work like that, as in get one mark for that and then the rest of your evaluation. It's marked holistically in bands, as you know. Um, if you are using something in evaluative sense, you really don't want to spend too much time AO1ing it and explaining it. If you're using it in evaluative sense, like we mentioned before, you want to tease the parts out of that point that demonstrate, support, challenge what you are evaluating. So you don't want to spend too much time explaining or outlining it, if you like. Hopefully that, that clears that one up, makes sense. Someone said, can you get marks for information written in a plan? You can, it depends if it's detailed enough. Um, if you've just got random words that mean something to you, but not the examiner, then you won't. If you've used the information in your answer and it's in your plan, then you wouldn't get double marks for it because it's there twice. I would Laura, to be, be safe, saying, say no. Laura, we should be saying to them, you do get marks for your plan because that's what we're trying to encourage. We're trying to encourage them all to make a plan because that's answers. Yeah, we plan know. is good. Yeah, aren't we know better than good. guys? Um, you but know, you know that square way, box? No... But that square box that they get, like, at the top of an yeah. essay, where the, we do want to plan, and you're going to feel like you haven't got time to plan, but you you have you have got time to plan. You know, spend two minutes getting your head together, getting what goes in, selecting the right stuff. It'll, it'll pay off in the end. But what I'm saying is that if you've wrote something like, Let's just go with rutter because people are still mentioning rutter. If you put the word rutter in your plan and it's not in your essay, you're not getting a mark for saying rutter. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Uh, sorry, I think we've just got a comment about um, TZ. So, TZ, rutter was Romanian orphans. No, you're right. Rutter is Romanian orphans. <clears throat> um, da, da, da. Do we need to know the coding capacity duration studies? It says it in a spec as features of the MSM. And this is a really good question, actually. Um, mm. There are so potentially, this is how AQA could get around this. Okay, so firstly, Sperling, Peterson, Peterson, Badley, all of those are not quoted in the spec, right? However, the way they get around it is by saying, explain or outline a research study investigating the duration of short term memory. So in actual fact, that would be a small question. They wouldn't be able to ask really, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Laura, they wouldn't, it'd would be really mean if they asked an extended question on that, it's likely to be a small like four marker, two marker, three marker or six marker. Um, but yes, you do need to know those studies. And I think the key thing to know about those studies is really the findings more. Um, I think it's handy to know Sperling, Jacobs, Peterson and Peterson in terms of the procedure, because sometimes um, you might get something like a six marker where you will need to outline it in a bit more detail. Um, but I think be mindful, they can't ask you specifically on those studies, but they can get around the wording by asking you to outline a research study investigating the duration of long term memory, for example. So in answer, yes, do you know those? Yeah. I think the other thing to mention on that, though, is that just, you know, you've done them. They're quite memorable anyway. Um, you know, Miller's magic number, the Peterson triagram one. If you know them, you can use them for your AO3 in the multi store model essay. So if you make them part of your evaluation for the multi store model, then then you've dealt dealt with two problems at once, haven't you? There. Um, there was a question there by oh, they keep going up too slow. Um, it was about oh, I know what it was about. It was about a write in a discuss essay question. So if Ooh, we can yeah. just have the 16 marker plan on the screen. <clears throat> so we do tend to, I mean, all teachers will say, if you're asked to discuss something, then it's just outline and evaluate. And it pretty much is. Let's take this question on the screen. Discuss the cognitive interview technique. So for our AO1, we'll do our AO1. We'll talk about the four concepts of, of the four steps of a cognitive interview, whatever, whatever, the A1 for whatever the question is. Now, in an outline and evaluate question, we would just go for it in terms of evaluation. The only thing different that discuss means is that they are going to expect you to put both strengths and limitations. It's good practice anyway to do that, but technically you don't have to in all essays. So if you think about a discussion, it's not just a monologue, is it? It's, it's not just you talking about one opinion. It's about listening to another opinion as well. So if you're doing um, some really good effective evaluation anyway, if you're giving a strength and countering it with a limitation, that's discussion. If you give um, two strengths and two limitations, that's discussion as well. So the word discuss 
doesn't you know, don't let it put you off as long as you're writing good evaluation anyway you should at this point have some natural discussion anyway in your evaluation now i i've put on this plan about having four io3 points but um not necessarily again like i said earlier it's about the, the way that you write it so if you can do three good points and in each of them points you've got discussion or you've got counter criticisms or maybe you've made the link to issue and debate or you've contrasted it with something else then you, you're writing so well and linking things together you don't need four points but if you're not doing these meaty of effective evaluation paragraphs then then try and get more points in because there is what we call a breadth depth trade-off you got anything um, else on that water no, no nothing else on that i mean just really kind of uh yeah that the evaluation is all about quality over quantity and i think too many times as a examiner seeing too many kind of extended questions too many extended answers where it's almost like a shopping list of points and it's like a couple of sentences and I think a really important thing to do, and I know it sounds really pedantic, but when you do your evaluation, leave a line space between each evaluation point because you can visually see then, have you written enough? And too many students are writing as a block of writing. And when I go through my students that feedback, I'm like, well, put a double dash for each point. And they find that one of their points is literally a sentence. And I'm like, well, that's not elaborate enough. You haven't explained yourself. So always you know, leave a line space per point and have it as a separate paragraph so you can visually see and check in with yourself and be like, right, does that look like enough for an evaluation point? Probably not, mm -hmm. I need to add detail. Um, Tanya's asked before, so I'm just going back at some of these uh, questions. Um, Tanya, you've asked, it says on advanced spec, this, this shows the major focus of the content of the exam. How does that equate to that being all that we are examined on? We can confirm that is all you're going to be examined on. I think it's been it's been a question that's been asked quite a bit at the start when this was released. Um, you won't be asked on any other facet of, of the actual spec that hasn't been put in the advanced specification. So just to clear that one up, Laura, do you do you want to uh, add into that? Just um, for research method, don't panic. If you see something that's not on the advanced spec, it'll probably just be in a research methods question. And therefore yeah. the questions on research methods, not that thing itself. Yeah. I think that's panicked some people in some GCSE tests, haven't it? Um, will you be limited in marks if you don't remember the names? Um, I don't know what you tell your students, Laura, but I'm 100% sure that you won't. No, you won't, you won't get... Um... It won't have an effect on your overall marks. The only thing I will say, if you are going to say research has found, let's say you've forgotten the researcher's name. There are so many to remember. And of course, a lot of you have probably been told to put that. And that's totally fine, by the way. So let's say you said research has found. Um, as long as what you write that follows that is distinguishable as that study to the examiner, it's not some blase made up study. And believe me, I've read them, the made up ones. Um, as long as it's not too generic and it's, it's distinguishable as that study, you're all good. You can say that research has found that's totally fine. Obviously, the studies that are quoting the spec, please don't say research has found. I mean, if you've forgotten it, you've forgotten it, you're going to have to say that. But you know, the likes of, you know, the key studies that are in the advanced spec, you should really remember those as a minimum. Other studies, if you forget the names, um, yeah, as long as it's not generic, um, and it's not as long as it's di distinguishable, you should be absolutely fine to do that. Um, can we uh, can we get up the eight marker plan as well some people are asking about an eight marker so if you get an eight marker um then it's it's half a 16 marker really isn't it um so i would always plan it like this you could i think do someone asked could you just do one evaluation point and i'm going to say yeah but that evaluation point needs to be amazing it needs double to walker yeah, it needs to have a counter criticism in there. It needs to have a good conclusion. It needs to show enough skill and enough knowledge in that one point that you don't have to do anything else for evaluation, which is why some people um, would prefer to, to do two. So you could, you're more likely to, to get full marks with two, I would say, than one, but it's not impossible to do it with one. And then if we could just put the 16 marker back on, because somebody asked about what if this came up as a AO2 question. So in this one that's on the screen, this is AO1, AO3. So the marks are roughly split six and 10. If this was an AO2 question and we had a little story there that we had to apply to as well, then the marks roughly go six for AO1, four for AO2 and six for AO3. So all I would do, if you want to visualize it now, I would just borrow two of them AO3 boxes, put them in the middle and change it to AO2. 
So you still have some AO1, you do a bit of referencing for your AO2, and then we go back to normal evaluation. So if you if you if you plan your essays, you could even just jot something down like that and plan essays like that. And it's a really good, quick, easy way to visualize what you'll need. Um, we mentioned the double whopper there, so let's have a look at that. If you are going to go for writing less points but writing them better, then this is the type of structure that you've got to have in your evaluation. So you can't, if you're going to go for writing less but um, writing better, then we can't just be saying things like such and such a study supports this theory or one limitation of is this, therefore it's a problem. You're going to have to really develop it. So you want to start off with what your point is, a strength or criticism and what it is. And that's normally only a sentence. Give us the elaboration. So if you're using a study, that might be where you um, go into detail about it, like the 44 thieves and you know, what it is they found, what they concluded. If you can then talk about issues and debate, great. If you can alternatively counter it, so you might say that one study to challenge this, however it is, or however someone else has disagreed, because we start knitting this chain of discussion together. And even though you're only right on one point, it's going to be a this total cliche, it's going to be a double buffer <laughs> of a point. So that's what I would say. My only advice is if you're going to go for writing less points, they've got to be great. Yeah. There are two questions I just want to answer. One's by Georgia Maynard, who's asked this twice. So any sorry for not answering this earlier, Georgia. Any tips on answering 16 marks of a scenario? And then next we'll go to Lauren Leeson. What should uh, the elaborate consist of an appeal paragraph? How is it different from the explanation? So, um, Georgia, yes, with a scenario for a 16 marker, the way you want to view that really is integration. So a lot of students write their AO1, let's say their theory or their study, and then they do a separate paragraph for their AO2 and then they do their AO3. Instead of seeing it as separate, when you have a STEM, what you should be doing before you even start writing, this is where planning comes into place, especially with a STEM 16 marker, you should be annotating the STEM and circling the areas or highlighting the areas that link with the theory. So when you actually come to formulating and writing your answer out, you're doing a bit of theory and then demonstrating or linking that, referencing it with the STEM. And then doing another bit of theory and then referencing linking that with the stem so it should be like a puzzle piece it should be integrated as opposed to separate now the reason for that is if you do a separate ao2 what you end up doing and i've seen it many times students end up repeating their ao1 because inevitably you have to explain your ao2 using the theory so really get into integrating and i think one way around that is to annotate your stem with the theory links so that makes it easier of how you're going to structure it when you actually write it um so, lauren, uh, laura lauren i had two or three questions did you mention it was the peel paragraphs that you wanted to do yeah address? it was the peel yes got yes, it, it found it the there we go. so um lauren um peel the way i teach it laura everyone might teach it slightly differently but it's going to be the same same but different um obviously you've got your point uh, the way i do the two e's is explain your point like why is that a weakness or strength and then my second e usually is evidence slash example because we don't have evidence for everything so just give an example instead. So the evidence is referring to like um, the study findings, for example, that you might demonstrate in there to, to kind of give your point a bit more kind of rigor uh, and then your link back. So um, elaborate explanation. I guess the point here is with appeal, if you've been taught that way, is to make sure you fully expand and fully explain yourself with your point. But I would say one of those E's I would have as evidence or example. But if you don't have evidence and you don't have an example either, you might want to, as Laura's just been through, turn that into a double whopper and kind of do a counterpoint within there in that second D. I've spotted two questions as well. Um, I feel like we're on question time. Yeah, there's, there's so many good questions <laughs> coming our way. So we uh, just to, just to explain, Laura, we, we can't finish until every question's been answered. So uh, hang <laughs> on. Right, so we'll, be, we'll be here all flipping night. <laughs> <laughs> Someone called Missing You Forever asked us a question about evaluating studies. Um, if you're evaluating studies, do you just do general stuff or do you talk about methodology? And that's a really good question. Let's say, for example, you're evaluating, um, well, you can evaluate Milgram's study in the situational variables, but it's got to be specific. So can you just use generic evaluation? N no, you can write it you might get a really sensitive marker who, who gives you one or two marks, but it's got to be contextualized. So if a really good example of this actually is for attachment and animal studies. So you know, when you're looking at animal studies, 
you, you're normally going to say we've got problems with generalization because they're animals we're not humans and so on but you've got to make it relevant to attachment because that same point we could say about any animal study animal studies and sleep animal studies and um psychopathology the the answer has got to be relevant the criticism has got to be relevant to the topic that the question is on and if it's not if you can pick up your answer and put it in another question and it still makes sense then you haven't made it specific enough and we had another question from j04 about social support can we use mill gram and ash in our ao3 absolutely you can make life easier for yourself if we're talking about um social support both Milgram and Ash can be used to show that it does affect obedience and conformity. So yeah, absolutely. Spotted Enzo, um, if you do not include issues and debates in evaluation, can you not get 16 out of 16? It's funny you ask that question because with the old spec, that actually was the case. You're not on the old spec, you're on the new spec. You're on the spec you're doing. And I can confirm, if you don't put any issues and debates, and that's not going to limit you to not get 16 out of 16. But what I will say to you guys I would say, even though only a few of the issues and debates are on the advanced spec, you would be, you, it would be silly not to know all the issues and debates. And the reason I say that is, is because that you, you've already learned them. You have already learned them at this point. Most of you would have anyway, um, and they act as such easier evaluation to be able to recycle throughout all of the three papers. So instead of remembering a unique evaluation point, you can only use for that topic, and then another unique evaluation point you can only use for that topic. Think about your issues and debates and think about how you can apply that to all of your topics. And it does work. And again, just to um, kind of on that point that Laura said about general points, it can't be general. You know, when you're applying an issue and debate, it's got to be super specific to your topic. And, and one other thing about issues and debates, if you're going to use it for evaluation, please do not say... And if you know, a weakness of this, it's only the nature, the nature debate or it's only the nature side of the debate. That's incorrect. It's the nature versus nurture debate. It's the relative contribution of each to a given behavior. When you are going to use a debate, it's a debate. It's two things. So you can't just say it's, you know, biologically reductionist and not talk about holism in your point. You can't say something's deterministic and not talk about free will in your point. It's a debate. You have to discuss both within there. So that's really, really important. You do well, need to Oh, sorry. I was just saying we've had a couple of questions just coming whilst you were doing that one on highlighting or annotating the stem. I know that was something which you had uh, some comments on. Is, should we deal with that? I've never. I I don't know about you, Laura, but I there's no issue. I don't think with underlining no. or anything with the stem or annotating it. No. I think it, someone it, did say don't highlight your stem in the answer because it might not show up on the computer. I've never. I seen would. I would like actually say. I'd say 100% do it. I, I sometimes encourage my students to do it even before they've looked at the question. Because Absolutely. when you're given, the thing to remember about these little scenarios that you get is that they're written by the examiners or the examiner team, knowing what questions they're going to ask you, and therefore knowing what type of clues they need to put in these little stories. So for example, this is a tutor to you one. So, so when our um, team have put this together, that stuff there that's highlighted in the red, that's there on purpose so that you can fish it out and find it and use it in your answer to that question. So I would 100% annotate it, circle it, highlight it, do whatever you like with it. It really doesn't matter. As long as your answer's visible, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question on, oh, it's always raining. Asked if we got a 16 marker on Milgram study, would we have to bring in any of his variations? You need to flip that round so you won't get anything just on milgram's original study the only thing on the advanced info is the situational variables so 100 percent, you have to know them situational variables inside out rather than just general milgram and that you you, sh you probably won't talk about the 65 just the version where 65 percent pressed 450 volts you need all those different ones like proximity location and so on We've got a question on, could you give an example of how to use issues and debates as evaluation? I don't mind answering that one. So attachment, for example, um, if you were going to uh, do a, an evaluation point on, let's say the question was about the learning theory and Bowlby's monotropic theory of explaining attachments, you might say, you know, a weakness of the learning theory in explaining attachment formation is it only takes the nurture side of the nature-nurture debate and it ignores nature 
Um, so that's how you might introduce that. You could then bring Bowlby's monotropic theory in saying that it kind of includes a bit of both because it's coming from an evolutionary perspective. It's, you know, our nature, our inheritance, passing down genes, but it's also we adapt to our environment. So it might be a better explanation, more interactionist approach at explaining attachment formation. So that's how you might bring an issue in debate into evaluation of, of a theory in paper one. If you so haven't learned question. all of this, sorry. Today, oh. sorry, Laura, someone asked, I haven't learned, I, I'm not confident or haven't learned all the issues. At this point, I'm not going to say, if you don't know them all, yes, learn them all, you should do them, your paper ones on Tuesday. No, if you're at this point and you're not confident in all the issues and debates, I'm not going to say, go and focus on that. You should be focused on paper one. If you already know your issues and debates, I want you to be mindful to try and utilise that in your evaluation because it makes sense and it's easier. Um, Isabel said, so would you just write about milligrams original study first, then the variations or just the variations, um, just the variations this year, just the variations, another year it would be, it would be both. And there was a question, so Eden, I think you keep asking, why would your teacher tell you, um, to explain how gender might affect minority influence with things, when you're saying things like a, a, a sample isn't representative. So if it's only men or it's only women or it's only Americans or whatever, then you do need to go beyond and say why that's an issue. Otherwise, you just look like you've got an issue who with, with whoever was in the sample. So generally with, with gender, you can talk about biology. There's biological differences. So, you know, even down to levels of oxytocin and, and hormones and, and chromosomes, women respond differently to men to some situations. So when you're looking at conformity and obedience, that matters, doesn't it? Some of those biological differences make us more likely to obey and conform, but only biologically. And then socially, socially, women are more socialized to be obedient than men. So I reckon, uh, Eden, that might be what your teacher might have been asking you to, to think about. You can't just say a sample was only men and it can't apply to women and therefore that's a limitation. You're gonna to have to convince the examiner that there's a difference there that does matter. And if you can't, I'd probably pick another point rather than just write write a sentence or two on it. Oh, we've got um, a good question. Are there are the differences in the heads of the fake monkeys in Harlow study counted as confounding variable? Um arguably the cloth covered mother had a more monkey like face they should that should have been controlled they had different faces you're right and well done for noticing that and the wire monkey definitely didn't look so much like a, a monkey face um you could arguably say that that may have confounded the dv slightly and that could have been a reason one of the reasons why they may have spent more time on the cloth covered mother i mean you could bring that into play into evaluation i don't think of you'd get far with it though to be honest do you not think? No. I mean, it's not wrong. I just don't think beyond saying that, I don't know what else you're going to say. There's there's better things to select. Yeah, there's definitely um, better evaluation, but in terms of extraneous or confounding, because it's it's done, it, it, it would have affected the DV potentially. It would be seen as confounding out of those key terms. Hmm. It's a funny one, that, isn't it? Everyone loves that study. Um, it's the same with the likes of the Bobo doll. When, when there's an opportunity to talk about it, people write loads, but you've got to remember what they're asking you for. If they're only asking for results, only write results. If they're asking you for procedures, only write procedures. Just because you know it all doesn't mean that it's all relevant for the question. Um, well, have you, have you spotted another one there, Laura? I'm just trying to read them all. It's come through so far. Uh, Is there loss of some Palmer on memory uh, in a normal year? Yes, not on not this year. Um, we've done that one. My invigilator stopped me using my highlighter in my mock. I think that is a coincidence. You're only allowed to write your answer in black pen, and that's because it gets scanned. So make sure you got your black pen. And someone asked before, can you should you take a calculator? Yeah, take a calculator to all your exams. Um, you can use your highlighter. Um, I think that was just an, an, an overly conscientious invigilator. We've had this question a few times, Laura, which is how do you evaluate neural explanations of OCD? I think a lot of students struggle with the biological explanations and treatments yeah. of OCD. I would say biological is actually it could be quite easy to to evaluate actually so you could definitely compare and contrast that with other approaches to explaining mental health disorders as well as there is a whole amalgamation of issues and debates that you can use so 
although this isn't an issue in debate on the spec, but um, the fact that it has scientific rigor as an explanation when explaining um, that disorder um, or any disorder, you could also use that it's a biologically reductionist versus holism. You could say um, nature nurture as well in terms of the explanation. So there are quite a lot of issues and debates that you can apply there as well as studies that you could use as well as the fact that it's created drug therapy which has been great means people can live their life successfully that have you know really severe symptoms or really crippled by their illness so there's actually quite a lot of evaluation potentially for you know in terms of a biological explanation that you could potentially utilize there you know what i always think so for, is um just it's, it feels like a bit of an oversight on the biological explanation if you just think about what o oc stands for obsession and compulsion so an obsession's a cognition and compulsion is a behaviour and none of them are acknowledged by, by the biological approach at all so you've got even that type of stuff that you can talk about we've got a massive section on that actually in our grade booster support package because we know it is one that um, people struggle with a lot i think it's just the biology nature of it isn't it because it goes into the genes and the brains and it just seems too biological but if you can if you can evaluate the biological approach for paper two then you can borrow some of them points and contextualise them for OCD, I would say. Laura, Laura, I know we're approaching the, the hour mark and I know you wanted to maybe spend a minute or two with some top tips and final words. Is it worth putting those on screen before yeah, we uh, thank everyone for joining us? Um, so when you are doing your revision, at this point, what most students tend to be doing right now is um, rewriting the notes reading highlighting underlining make flashcards make mind maps what i would say to that i don't know if any of you have studied growth mindset but they're all actually preparation things so they're good and they're handy and they're really useful but at this point now the most effective things that you can be doing is practicing your recall practice questions look at mark schemes see if what you're selecting is is accurate you know, even those things are what's important when you're doing things like flashcards and mind maps and highlighting and underlining just think about the way the multi-store model of memory you're taking stuff in but memory isn't just getting it in it's getting it back out so if you can't practice recalling that information then you, you you're selling yourself short a little bit really and um i'll leave the other points for you to talk about laura but i think go beyond your comfort zone really 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 tempting to just spend time on what you know isn't it? I always say to my students, think about, think of 10 questions that could come up and if they come up, you'd, you'd cry there and then. That's what you need to be revising now. <laughs> we did that once as an activity, I give them a mock, a mock that I thought might make them cry because why have you done it? You know, that's, it's just the unlucky nature of life that those things will come up. But if we can prepare for them, great. What yeah, I think well? going on what Laura said with going beyond your comfort zone with the I, I I say to my students stop writing detention lines out which is basically rewriting your notes out again and again and that may have worked way back in the past when you're at school I don't know but at this stage with what they're looking for and how this is being assessed and the skill base that you need to build up where you where you're going to be increasing that skill base is really exam style questions um, and going beyond your comfort zone. Even if you feel like you don't know, I think a lot of you are gonna be really surprised about what's actually stuck up here. And the only way you're gonna feel confident that you know it is by actually testing yourself without your notes and in time conditions at home. And then looking at the mark scheme and learning from it or knowing and thinking, Christ, I did actually really well on that. I thought I wasn't doing too well and I was gonna spend the whole hour revising it when actually you know it really well. So I think, you know, exam style questions and, and going out of your comfort zone at home and not doing what you normally do is actually really helpful. Um, going forward. Um, make sure, I know probably all teachers say this and we drum it into you guys and somehow it doesn't quite translate to being done so much, but no time wasted in the exam is reading the question a few times. Two, I would say the majority of mistakes, like literally the majority of mistakes in the exam in AQA are made from not reading the question properly and, and, and not slowing down. So this is what we mean when we say, please plan your questions, please highlight, underline parts of the questions. I know it sounds really kind of like mundane and yeah, I'll, I'll just highlight the command word or whatever, but it honestly makes such a huge difference. And you might not be consciously aware of that, but as examiners, we know it makes a big difference to your answer. So slow down, never read a question once, read it several times. 
If there's a planning box, even if there isn't a planning box, plan, then formulate and write your answer, okay? You know, before we finish, I'm just seeing something come on chat now. There's some confusion going on about abnormality. Definitions of abnormality is on there. Um, can you get a 16 mark question on them? Yeah, you can. Some of you have said that there's not enough AO1 to get an essay question on. There is. There's probably, you're not likely, I've never seen one, a question on just one of them. They normally come as a two or it might say one or more. But you definitely yeah. can and it definitely is on there. So if you've got questions about what is and what isn't on the advanced information, check AQA website, check with your teacher. Um, just, just don't go into there with some duff information. Wow, we have reached the hour mark, and uh, unfortunately, we only pay uh, by the hour, and I can't afford another hour uh, of uh, the specialist expertise from Laura and Laura. But that is ab well done, the two of you. I mean, what, an, what a fantastic uh, student audience with some great questions. Also, uh, what you don't see on screen, maybe you're joining us uh, on replays, you don't see the number of students helping each other and answering yeah. each other's questions and encouraging people and. Um, putting a, an arm around the shoulder to say you're going to be fine. It's been happening the whole time in the live chat, which uh, yeah. not, not, it's not a surprise, not a surprise, but it's great to see. Uh, so we really do appreciate everybody who's contributed here live and um, making Someone Laura and Laura's said, job so hard because there's been so many questions. <laughs> Someone's just said, um, will we be doing a session on psychopathology? So I think this is the only clinic for paper one uh, with it being on Tuesday and we, we don't want to, panic anyone the night before the exam so the next time we'll do this is for paper two but in our grade booster we have got um hours and hours we've, we've put it on uh, just a few days ago we've got an hour on every topic that's in your advanced information and then we've got an hour and a half of question walkthroughs where we do something like this but we just put a question on the screen tell you how to answer it you go and answer it we look at a model answer so the types of things that you're asking for if you found this beneficial, you, you'll absolutely find that gold dust. So uh, get yourself. Well, yeah, ab well done. I mean, yeah, we're not not here to try and sell uh, Grey Booster, but get yourself onto Grey Booster because <laughs> obviously everybody. I mean, we had about three thousand students when Jimmy joined us in the uh, yeah. in the cinema tour, Just and uh, an there. amazing course, an amazing course. Yeah. Uh, but as you and say, everything yeah, everything there. Our, yeah. um, on our Grey Boosters, our live revision sessions that we do weekly are only mm. live streamed to the Grade Booster students now. So they're not just available for you guys on YouTube anymore. They're just for Grade Booster. So really, really worth it. Um, Cause obviously, you know, resources are gonna be continually added to that as well, especially running up yeah. to each exam paper. So I'm, make, I'm making it sound come. like a QVC shopping channel, aren't I, Lara? But uh... <laughs> we'll stop, we'll stop. Everyone, for <laughs> some people getting panicked here and, and you're yeah. scared. And you know, all I'll say just to finish this off is that It'd be bizarre and worrying if you weren't at a start. But also, you've got to get your head around the fact that you don't have to remember everything. You've just got to you've got to apply your skill. Read the question, plan your answer, select some of the right stuff, write it well. It doesn't matter about how much of the content you know and how well you know the likes of Milgram. If you can't write it about it, it's not going to get you very far. So just just there's loads of time. Might not feel like it. But sleep's overrated, okay? Going out is overrated. <laughs> True. So you can, you, you've got loads <laughs> of time to do lots of practice stuff. So keep calm. And if you're getting yourself into a little bit of a state, then there's absolutely no point in doing any revision for the next hour. So go for a walk, do, do something, go and watch Netflix or whatever. Just do don't right. go on TikTok because you'll lose hours. Okay. Just don't go. You also lose hours on Netflix, Laura. So maybe put a time <laughs> limit on these little breaks that you're having. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. the world will go. So well done, everyone. You've been amazing, and we'll oh, yeah. see you on the Too right. um, And Laura, Laura, thank you because uh, I'm absolutely blown away by your ability to answer absolutely every question, and um, <laughs> that is amazing. I mean, to be honest with you, it is. Uh, well, I'm not surprised, of course, because I know how uh, how good you are. But uh, that is a, a, a tour de force tonight, so I appreciate that. And I think the format uh, works quite well. So, as you say, we'll once we've got paper one out of the way, we will we will return. And see whether we can. Jim, can we some, can yeah. we let them know when our paper two uh, one? Yeah, is we can. Be? I know we've got the the schedule, haven't we, lined up? So I'll get them. I'll get them on the website in the morning, uh, and okay, then obviously great. everyone on Grey Booster will get an email in the morning alerting them. But we'll make sure that we let everyone everyone know on the front of the uh, the tutor two psychology website. I think there's a, there's a, an, an automatic feed, isn't there now that shows when yeah. the mm -hmm. the next uh, stuff is coming up. 
all the best, everyone, on uh, Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning. Um, yeah, really best of luck, guys. Yeah, all the best. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.